May we get settled so that we can start, get started. I know that we have had a little bit of time challenges. However, I do intend to stick to time so that we don't uh, miss our lunch or anything. I don't want to uh, make anybody suffer from food insecurity and malnutrition because I am a nutritionist indeed, and I would like everybody to be comfortable. So without further ado, may I introduce myself as your moderator for the day. I was told to remove my earring because I'm wearing the Rovi mic, so don't worry, I'm not being funny. So my name is Buisa Bibi, as you can see. I'm going to be your moderator for this session on governance for agri-food systems transformation. There's a lot we're going to be hearing from our panelists today, and there's a lot to discover, there's a lot to discuss, and a lot to glean at the end of the day. So let me start by saying good morning, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, good evening, from wherever you're joining us from across the globe. We are very pleased that you have taken the time to join this session this morning. Uh, we highly revere your presence and appreciate your participation because without your thoughts, without your critique, without your inputs, we will not be able to achieve our goals and our expectations for this session today. So a very warm welcome once again, and on behalf of the organizers of this session and myself as your moderator, I would like to say bienvenue, benvenido, welcome, caribou, and everything. Now, understandably, unpacking and understanding governance may appear complex and elusive at times, precisely because of that. However, the importance of governance in achieving more equitable, resilient, and sustainable food systems has emerged since the beginning as a game changer. Thanks to the first UN system summit that showed us that Governance is very critical for everything we need to do. That said, indeed it is easier said than done. To date, all national governments are embarking on a long-term journey to do pathway ma mapping on the criticalities, synergies, and trade-offs around governance. So these mappings have to necessarily be viewed through a multi-sectoral lens across a myriad of sectors to improve, first of all, coordination, secondly, consultation, and reach a common goal and objectives and outcome for impact on the ground. Because we don't want to be talking at ourselves or at you, we want to be having a conversation, a dialogue with you that is inclusive that also makes sure that in terms of governance, we start from the ground up. So governance is critical for decision making and accountability. Accountability, accountability is really key. Th so through the country dialogues that preceded the food summit two years ago, we all got challenged, in fact, to probe and answer some glaring questions, which we may have been dodging or sugaring or buttering up. So now, how do we ensure system, a system-based or system-based approaches with relevant stakeholders, sectors for coordination, for a coordinated and coherent and transformative action? You can't do transformation if you don't include all the stakeholders and all the players. Secondly, how do we mo mobilize and empower all these actors to play their part and contribute in a meaningful way, including the most marginalized and the most vulnerable, because the voices are often not taken into consideration because they may not be present at the table. And last but not least, how do we get the complex and multidisciplinary evidence required to include the political economy and take informed decisions? So ladies and gentlemen, Today, we are really in for a treat. As we will be hearing from our very able experts and panelists from across the world who will shed some light based on their varied experiences and arrangements by their own countries. 
The panelists will also share, of course, their challenges, their lessons, and successes. And then in the end, we shall all collectively come up with some consolidated messages that we can take home and please let those me messages sit on the floor or the cupboard and gunner dust. I'll, I'll not be a happy camper out of this session. So I've spoken enough. Let me dive right into our speakers this morning. We have four panelists and two uh, respondents. I will start, uh, okay, I'm going to be biased because I'm a lady. I'm going to be start with a lady. I'm going to start with um, Anaya. Anaya is um, a parliamentarian. Anaya is a dean, a member of the Lebanese Parliament, National Parliamentary uh, Committee, and she is going to be responding to a couple of my questions. So Anaya, a report uh, on regional priorities from the from the, the STM Regional Preparatory Meeting for, Arab, for the Arab region, highlights the need to leverage the power of legislation and the role of parliamentarians to support the transformation. And then how are, or what are the legislation and parla parliaments bringing to the agenda in your experience to ensure inclusive and effective implementation of actions to transform food systems. How do you address our crowd today? Over to you, Anaya. Thank you very much. Good morning, and thank you for inviting me to this very interesting panel. Uh, of course, it's time for the parliaments to take their role, to jump to the front line and take their role in voicing the needs and the concerns of people and to put a solid basis for the solutions. Uh, why? Because uh, parliamentarians are democratically elected, and this, as much as it is an advantage maybe over other stakeholders, it puts on them a great responsibility. Because in the parliament, there is a big diversity of the social and political fabric of the society. They come together, they can discuss the needs together and try to find solutions. And this has to be done at the three levels, uh, at the three levels of the three roles, all levels of the roles of the parliamentarians. First, at the level of the legislation, because parliaments have to legislate for laws that are adapted to the changing world that we live in now. And uh, the current laws, unfortunately, maybe in a lot of countries, are not aligned with the realizations of the importance of the pressures that the world, the ecology, the environment is facing, that people are facing by the poor nutrition, by the lack or absence of uh, enough local production for food, also by the transition towards the increasingly uh, globalized diets that are not fit for humans or not for the environment. And this is why it's very important and actually extremely important for parliaments to face and understand the changes that are happening and the impact of the trends on the life of people and on the planet. And it's their duty to, to cast within the legislation a legal code for all these rights the right to live in a healthy environment, the right, the right to, live, to have access, sustainable access to nutritious uh, food in a stable, sustainable, and equitable uh, manner, and the right to live in the absence of fear of not having enough to eat, to eat and, and um, the right to grow to their full uh, potential. And this is why we have to solidly cast within the legal code all these transformations that are coming to us by our increasing uh, Im improved knowledge about these trends. And uh, by um, parliaments can have the role also at the level of the oversight. Uh, parliaments can hold the executive, the governments accountable for integrating the transformation towards, uh, towards this, this system thinking about the food um, about the food within the plans and projects of the different sectors and to hold them accountable for every action or failure of action towards that, towards the transformation. And also, uh, Parliament can exert this role by uh, looking at the budgeting uh, uh, the, uh, and hold and the budgeting process where all, every sector has to integrate within the budgeting system uh, um, enough financing 
everything for the transformation. And this necessitates that we move towards a program-oriented budgeting rather than the way budgeting is being done in some country nowadays. How do we integrate it in the law? Of course, we know that uh, the right to access food in its nature is a complex. It is associated and related to uh, multi-sectors, multi-disciplines. And, of course, the general principles of uh, sustainable, resilient, and equitable food transformation uh, can be framed, the, the general principles can be found in a framework law. However, uh, one law is not enough and cannot be dealt with in one law because we know that many the different components of the food system transformation are legislated for in different sectors, which means that we have to find the right connections, the legislative infrastructure and the institutional setup to link these laws together. And this necessitates that we do a stock taking um, exercise about our legal framework to decide where are the good, uh, in every sector, where, where are the good laws that support this transformation, but they are not, maybe they're not, they're not sufficient and, uh, and we need to also identify the laws that are not supportive and work on maybe on cancelling them, amending them, and uh, we articulate all of these laws within a framework in order to do a gap analysis and complement it with the uh, missing laws. And the second second step that we have, the second stock talking um, that we have to make is about who is responsible for what. Are all the players present on the scene? Do we see all of them? We know it's a multi-stakeholder uh, uh, issue, uh, the food system. Many actors are seen, but maybe, but a lot of other actors are not seen. We have to bring all of them together, make them agree on what system transformation is, because I think the um, uh, system thinking is absent. We have a lot, for example, in Lebanon now, because of the economic crisis, maybe we have thousands of societies, civil societies, and many others, even international societies, are working on providing food for people, uh, either in kind uh, donations or in cash. However, uh, uh, there is no one uh, strategy, there is no one vision of what food tra transformation is, what sustainability for food is, and what uh, should be done. I think the, um, um, in a consultative approach, all of these uh, stakeholders have to come together to design the one unified strategy and vision for, uh, for uh, transformation in our food system, and also, not in, the, in designing, they have to be partners also in the implementation, we should know who is doing what and how are we getting the finances. And uh, this has to be legislated for. I think we have to have um, uh, all of the uh, uh, laws related to the general framework law to the right to diet in the, in the legal code. And there should be a, an, inst an institutional architecture that defines the structure of the relationships, the tools, and a structure of accountability and responsibility. And this I call myself the scaffold in the legislation and in the regulation that should accompany the transformation and put the structure, a sustainable structure for a healthy, dignified life for every person, for every people, and for the planet, and for the environment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Inaya, for that very elucidating um, explanation on how your systems in Lebanon are working. I picked up a few points. I always have a seven-point thing about how I listen. So I picked up good laws, financing, legal instruments, right to food, serving the people, inst institutional structures, stru structures, and last but not least, consensus from and by the Actors. Now, since you are going to be leaving in a few minutes for plenary, may I ask you to give us two parting short messages, very concise in less than 30 seconds. Over to you. Nico? Yeah. Governance, for me. First, we have to agree on one vision on what food transformation, what 
a transformation towards a system thinking is, how do we integrate all the drivers, components, and outcomes in one vision and determine the governance structure for this common vision under which, under this umbrella, everybody has to work and find the resources and financing for implementing this transformation for the well-being of everybody and for the ecosystem. Thank you once again, Sinaya. A round of applause for her before she leaves. And now, moving right along, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Inaya is going to be leaving soon, but she may sit and listen for the next five minutes, uh, five minutes and so, since she still has time. Now, moving on to our next uh, speaker, other than, other than Edward Walugembe from Uganda. And I know Uganda has done very well as a country in terms of having a national planning authority around food security and nutrition since the days of the late, who was my friend, uh, Mr. Mugera. So, Edward, uh, Edward is the, is the National Food Systems Coordinate, Coordination Committee chairperson in the office of the Prime Minister. So you can see how Uganda has managed to elevate the issues of food security and nutrition beyond and above just a line ministry. So, Edward, can you tell us, what are you observing to work well in terms of ensuring that relevant diverse stakeholders do play their role to define and support implementation of the national strategic plan in Uganda? And are you seeing stakeholders actually expressing interest in converging around a common set of objectives and how far are the national efforts transforming food systems in Uganda? Mueva Lenyo, over to you. You have four minutes, strictly so. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies. Uh, thank you for the complex question. <laughs> Just as the food systems is complex. Uh, food systems, as we know, is the uh, complex. It's actually not uh, an action of government-wide approach, but it is a, it's a whole society approach. So it involves everybody, uh, it, uh, as an imp uh, yeah, and it affects everybody. So uh, we look at uh, coordination to bring together all the players in the society, the government players, uh, the stakeholders, st stakeholders, the consumers, the citizens, the minorities, and everybody. And this requires coordination. And it's very complex uh, because we need to uh, connect, uh, we need to coordinate and continue working. And, and we must also communicate uh, for success. A uh, coordination uh, would require us to understand what we are doing. And this is what we are doing as the coordination committee, putting together everybody, fostering broad mass sector participation, making sure that they are on the same page, understanding what we are doing, uh, which is inclusive, and then having effective collaboration, defining where we are going together, having a shared vision, strategy, and results. We work for the results, which we need to measure and track where we are at any time. So uh, we, we have to have clear and shared plans together to achieve uh, transformation. And uh, we also need to look at them critically. So when we are doing uh, food, food systems transformation, we know that already we have some food systems in place which are not fit for purpose, which need improving. And so we try to improve from there. And the current arrangement is that uh, we, we've been having sectors working on, food, on an aspect of food transformation, food system transformation. But in order to sustainably achieve food system transformation, we need to bring together a, a, a range of players to work together and achieve food system sustainability. And we are doing this to achieve uh, <clears throat> food security and uh, food safety 
to have, uh, so that the 49 million people of Uganda, of which 74 are in rural areas, and uh, of which 46 are children aged below 14 years, and with a population growth of 3.2% per annum, have sustainable food, and with the, a fertility rate of over 5.4 children per woman. So we, the, the population is increasing. The food systems need to be improved so that they, they can sustainably provide food to the citizens. And this is a right. So the, the issues that we need to look at, so how do we uh, work towards having a sustainable system, food systems that, that, that would provide for the growing population which moved at the same pace as the population so that there is zero hunger, so that uh, we achieve the rights that everybody needs to achieve. Uh, and I must also say that eight, per, eight out of 10 people in Uganda are below 35 years. So that is a youthful population, which is still very productive, which we need to provide for and requires concerted efforts. So when we come to the food systems transformation, also the prime minister uh, brings together all the players and tries to make sure that they're on the same page to achieve the objectives of food systems transformation for social uh, economic transformation. And uh, <clears throat> it requires a lot of cooperation and collaboration and joint working. So uh, what are we doing? We, and what has helped us to move. We have an institutional framework which is rooted in the uh, coordination policy of 2016, which articulates that uh, we leave nobody behind. Uh, the, the players are on board. And uh, we've, we've done the coordination and make arrangements for uh, the people to work together, for the sectors to work together. But again, with, below the sectors, you have the tracks, which do the technical work, which also need to co cooperate and also get other players who support them to make sure that uh, we achieve the objectives. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Edward. I will come back to you with some thoughts later. Also, when we open the q and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of interest from everybody from the floor. Now, what I heard from you, connect, coordinate, measure and track, and food safety is very important because we still have a lot of challenges around food safety in Africa, from farm to fork, literally. And then the right to food, which was also mentioned by Anaya, and then a very productive youth. We are not really, as Africa and the rest of the world, engaging youth in agriculture very much. We need to start rethinking how we engage the youth. Once again, thank you very much, Edward. Now, moving right along, let me move to Indonesia. One of the places that I love in the world, but I've never been there, by the way. <laughs> so uh, from Indonesia, we have uh, Jarod Indarto, the Director of Agriculture and National Convener, Ministry of National Development and Planning, Bapenas. So now, say, so can you just uh, tell us the territorial approaches and distinct levels of governance can be a challenge, and we all know that. Indonesia is not unique. But also a lever to ensure that actions at different levels effectively contribute to agri-food systems transformation. Considering the decentralization dis dis context in Indonesia, which ways are you finding to work in allocating budgets? for effective changes in the food systems in an inclusive way? And secondly, a follow-up question, how are trade-offs between different outcomes, productivity, economic prosperity, environmental protection, you know, nutrition, et cetera, et cetera, considered? Over to you, sir. And the clock starts now. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. 
uh, good morning, distinguished uh, panelists, and also all participants. Thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to share our experiences in transforming our food system in Indonesia. And in this uh, occasion, we would like to restate it again that <coughs> uh, Indonesia has committed to transform our food system as a crucial part to achieve the uh, 2030 uh, development agenda and also as a crucial part of our long-term national development planning uh, next 20 years until 2045. Uh, let me start by uh, saying that Indonesia is a huge and also decentralized country. Uh, we consist of 38 provinces and also 500 districts in Indonesia. And we inform you that all provinces and also all districts, they have their own direct election. So we can imagine how diversify, how various the local context of Indonesia. And they have their own, the richness of biodiversity and also culture. Uh, we would like to uh, share uh, some uh, actions that we are doing. One is uh, data and also evidence based uh, effort because it is import important to, uh, to, to see the threat of, as mentioned by Madam Chair, and also to give all stakeholders to engage because by having data and also evidence uh, scientific based effort, all stakeholders have the common understanding and also common perspective, and they have one, uh, I mean, common benchmark to exercise and also to uh, make argumentation. And we see that uh, it is going well, and we are very uh, uh, happy to be supported by some uh, development partners in, uh, in Indonesia from UN families and also some international uh, research in institutions. Uh, now we are uh, doing several uh, modeling work and also analytical uh, exercises to see uh, the threat of and also to uh, see, to scrutinize uh, more policy options to transform our uh, food system in Indonesia. And we are trying to uh, integrate and also incorporate it, the diversification of uh, our local context in that uh, analytical works. Another uh, effort that we are doing is uh, on financing. And now the central government uh, facilitating uh, all uh, district, all local government to develop their uh, local systems. And we do a kind of fiscal transfer. Uh, it is a kind of block grant from the central government that can be accessed by local government based on their needs and also based on their uh, local context uh, as well. Uh, finally, we also would like to share our effort how the central government uh, uh, giving the same framework to the uh, local government. Uh, what we are uh, doing is that we formulate a kind of uh, national action plan and also local action plans on food and nutrition. So that based on the national action plan framework, local government can uh, have a, a, a national a reference to develop their local uh, action plan on food and agriculture. Thank you.
Thank you very much, um, sir. I would now, um, thank you, Gerard. Okay, a few things I heard from you, four main ones. Of course, I mean, there's a lot of experience to be gleaned from Indonesia, but the most important thing, uh, you know, important things that I heard from him was engaging the research institutions, because we have to be able to move from research to policy and to program design and implementation thereof. And then analytical work around data, because in a lot of countries, we still are suffering from lack of data. So if you don't have the information, how can you have the evidence to even design that policy and work better? And then focus on local systems, because you are not going to be just working at national level and forgetting the grassroots. And last but not least, having a national and local action work plan, which is contextualized, because different parts of every country, of every region, are going to be very unique to, unto themselves. So once again, thank you very much. Now, moving to our last, but not necessarily least, Alvin Kopsi, Head of International Affairs and Food Systems and National Convener, Federal Office for Agriculture, Switzerland. Now, Alvin, you have a lot of experience, without doubt. Can you just tell us a little bit? We know Switzerland is this country that is uh, understood as being very efficient, things work very well, but can you just tell us Switzerland established a, citi a citizens' assembly on the future of food as a way of civil society participation to discuss solutions and develop policy recommendations. So that's very inclusive. Now, can you tell us more about it with its success and challenges, of course, because nothing is ever so perfect, and how it is contributing towards transforming the way food systems work and what are the next steps envisaged for, mo for moving Switzerland forward? Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, a, a baby. Hello, everybody. I think a, a, a lot of questions for four minutes uh, speaking time. Uh, but still, a, let me take a little bit of time and, and talk about the dialogues we organized actually in preparation of, of the Food System Summit two years ago. Why do we do that? Because those a, a dialogues were organized in a time where there was a lot of great deal of disagreement a, on the direction a agriculture policy should be taking a, in Switzerland. So the pre-summit offered us an opportunity to bring together farmers, a, the private sector, civil society, to start building a common understanding around a food systems transformation. So we very much could take together the, the usual subjects and start a, a discussing not only agriculture policy, but a, a bigger framework, a, a food systems and food systems transformation. We also organized a three dialogues with a cities. Why cities? Because in Switzerland, as in many other places, cities are actually drivers of change when they try to organize their own local a, food systems and we very much wanted to learn from them. So these, all these dialogues, they fed into the national pathway for food systems transformation as it was a, published. So then after this, the summit, a, we wanted to give the dialogues a little bit of a spin, do something a little bit different. So we were inspired by a recommendation of a OECD's report on food systems to conduct actually deliberative a processes with a randomly chosen group of people to address this agreement a, around food and, and food production. And as food, a tra food systems transformation is a whole of society task, we thought it is important to listen to a, the population, to listen to consumers, what would they recommend I, us should, should be done. So we set out last year to establish a temporary a citizens assembly for the future of food. A consortium of civil society organizations managed and planned the assembly. So it wasn't actually the, the, the government that uh, conducted that, but a uh, civil society organizations. Uh, uh, they uh, 
a group of 90 people was a selected, basically, off, off, the, off the streets. They, this group was disaggregated by gender, age, language, education, and political affiliation to represent a more or less the, the composition of the Swiss a population. These 80 to 90 people, they formed the assembly that was tasked then to pr produce recommendations a, a, on the future of a food systems in Switzerland. They were a, assisted by a group of scientists that provided expert advice, but on demand only. So only when they had questions, they would ask the scientists, what would you recommend we should be doing? So over five months, a, this group developed 126 recommendations. They covered issues a, related to health, environment, governance, consumption, and production of food. A, these recommendations were then presented to a greater public and to a, the government, the federal government, at the Swiss Food System Summit a, earlier this year. It was in, in, in February. And there are, interestingly, these recommendations, they go into the same direction as what the government has planned in its strategy, but what they ask for is more speed, and they certainly ask for a greater role of government in that transformation process. So what, what happens now? We have these uh, 126 recommendations. Uh, the Swiss federal parliament uh, mandated the, the executive branch to develop a dispatch for a new agriculture policy by 2027 that embraces a food systems approach. So in this process of preparing that dispatch, we are going through all these recommendations to assess how, whether and how we can actually integrate them in a, that dispatch. Uh, and for those we don't, we are not able to integrate, we give reasons why we won't do that. So it is, these recommendations also help us to think through and to, to, to get the right arguments together for, for the dispatch that then goes to parliamentary discussions. You asked me challenges. There were of course many, but just let me uh, highlight one. Switzerland is a, is a country with a lot of direct democratic means for the citizens to participate in decision making, be it on federal or be it on local levels. So we can reject a federal laws that were a, a approved by, by parliament. We have to agree to any a constitutional change. And so there was this argument that a citizen's assembly doesn't really have a role or a space in, in that process. We had to explain that the citizen's assembly wouldn't decide anything, but just come forward with a, a information and advice that would then feed into a regular decision-making processes. You know, ballots are about yes and no, but the citizen's assembly actually offered the chance to discuss to, to question, to understand, and to formulate a recommendation. So it was a, a very different process, uh, but a very rich one. So I hope I respect the four minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you once again, uh, Alvin, from Switzerland. Uh, a few things, and things jumped at me, uh, inclusion of the people. The whole of society has to be part of the processes. And I like the citizens' assembly very much because it doesn't happen in many countries that we are that inclusive. And then, of course, listening to the consumers. Because usually we sit in our offices and we think we can craft all the answers or design all the answers, but unless and until you listen to the people who are actually consuming the services and the products, you'll never be able to do so. And this is now leading to, the, to a demand-driven approach towards how you are crafting your food systems approaches and you know, uh, nutrition delivery. So once again, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, apparently we have a challenge of time around our interpreters because they work on very stringent time. Unfortunately, the previous session ate into our time, so the interpreters are going to be leaving at 12.40. So may I just ask uh, those non-English um, speakers to make their interventions from the floor before we go to our, our respondents. If there's anybody who does not... Uh, speak, understand English, and they have a question right now, may we kindly ask you to raise your flag, your hand, and do so. Don't be shy. Okay, I see a gentleman over there. Please go ahead, say your name, and 
your question in literally 30 seconds. No speeches, please. Merci, Bibi. Je me présente à Bouba Karmamoud. Je suis du Niger et je suis dans la gouvernance justement de la, des systèmes alimentaires. Et je remercie également tous les intervenants pour avoir en tout cas euh, partagé les éléments clés de la gouvernance. Ce que je voudrais poser comme question, est quelle est la place de l'engagement politique dans tout cela, le leadership le leadership et l'engagement politique pour la transformation des systèmes alimentaires. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much for that. I will uh, let the uh, speakers respond. May we have another one very quickly so that our panelists can respond to, to, to that first way? Yeah, okay. We'll go straight away to the respondents then. We have two respondents. Uh, one uh, lady, Miss Lani Ribagai. She's from uh, the Asian Farmers Association. And uh, so we would just like to hear, having listened to our four lovely panelists, what thoughts are bubbling to the surface that you can share with us and lessons we can learn from the panelists and lessons you can share with all of us in the room to improve how we experience and how we deal with issues of farming in, and food systems for better health and nutrition in all its totality. Over to you. Yes, thank in you. Thank two you minutes. very much, uh, Madam Chair. And I'm from representing Farmers Organization. Uh, we are happy to be represented in this space. Um, and we are very honored and we salute the very good effort, serious and honest effort of various governments to really engage different stakeholders uh, and of course uh, farmers. But um, I would like to flag some concerns, three points. One, um, the effort to break out from silos no, is very good. Uh, because there are indeed many incoherent uh, policies. Uh, I have attended many consultations. One government protects land rights, and another government incentivizes the selling of lands for trade, etc. So there should be really uh, a mechanism for, for coordination. There are three points we would like to put forward. One is consultation is very good. But consultation without genuine participation in decision making is also tiring. We are always consulted. Please attend this, attend this many, many uh, conference, but we're always consulted. But what we are seeing is never heard. So consultation is necessary, but not sufficient condition. There should be more uh, institutionalized mechanism for sustained participation in decision making. Second point, multi-stakeholder approach is very important. However, among stakeholders, there are different interests and some interests are, are not represented well because some have more capacity to influence, more resources to spend. But some, uh, some sectors like us, smallholders, have limited capacity to sustain our participation. Thus, our participation should be supported, financed, and should be made um, mandatory. Otherwise, only those who has capacities, uh, those who have uh, great interest can be, can be listened to. The third point is um, we would like to share what some good practices. At the global level, we are happy with IFAD because there's a farmer's forum. This is a, a regular forum coinciding with uh, uh, the governing council meeting. It's regular, it's sustained, it's funded. So we are able to give our voices. The second is the GAFSP model, where there is a mandatory, there is an annex three where all projects, farmers organization at country level, farmers organization should be part of the designing process. The last point is farmers organization also have our own FO-led mechanism to bring together 
different stakeholders. And through this, we are contributing in the coordination and synergy. In the Philippines, we have this knowledge learning and policy engagement annually conducted, which brings different governments to report to farmers organization, all government agency that has government projects. Through this, they, also the government can see what they're doing and what the other government is doing. Finally, we hope that in next UNFSS stock taking, we will not only be sharing our reflection, but will also be uh, accountable. Now, we'll also be equal partner sharing our contribution for the governance of the food system. Thank you very much. And our second respondent, before I move, I saw a hand from Florence Segal. I will uh, go to her before we finally wrap up. Now, Franco Sanchez from uh, IDLO, with a legal mind and a legal experience, Having listened to everything that was said from the panelists and with the interventions from the floor, how does it uh, resonate with your experience from a rule of law perspective in particular to ensure the realization of the right to food as part of implementing a sustainable food systems agenda? What needs to change? We know, all, we know the what. But how do we really do it in earnest? Over to you. Well, thank you so much, panelists, chair. Um, from a rule of law perspective, um, of course, governance is not something that appears uh, by default, appears by design. So there is a need to design a response for food systems transformation with governance that resounds with the institutions, with the legal framework, with the people that participate or are beneficiaries of the system. So uh, a few points. The first one is every system needs to be transparent, accountable, and inclusive. Uh, unluckily, all of the systems of governance have a, a common disease, which is corruption. So accountability and transparency is needed in all of those systems to protect the right to food, in order to tackle that thing. So that's one, something that was not said that I will add to the conversation. Second is the empowerment of the food system actors. Something of that was said from very different dimensions, but empowered to learn to claim for their rights in one side. And that's the responsibility of the design of the governance systems. The second one is that this inclusive participation should be available and should have the participation of individuals in the policy making and the design and in the decision making. Not just empowerment to know, but empowerment and entitlement to participate and make decisions. Especially those, as said by many of our colleagues, women, youth, farmers, the most affectable. I think we should take, for example, a strong feminist approach to food systems transformation. Women are usually the most affected and the more active in the food system production, distribution, and even in their households, eh, the supporters. The second point is the legal and institutional framework that was referred to for many of colleagues in Lebanon, also in, in Uganda, where institutions linked to the SDG 16 respond to the needs of individuals for the right to food. Judicial systems that can resolve conflicts of land, conflict of individuals, and conflict of the food systems change, the food systems transformation cannot go without a response from the legal, uh, from the judicial, and the inclusion of customary and informal justice into those systems. Mediation, arbitration, elder adjudication, whatever systems that can resolve the conflicts of within the food systems. Uh, a last one is the legal review. I think that was said very clearly by some of our uh, colleagues, but it constitutes the constitution, the laws, and the regulations by design, if we go out to the beginning, by design to respond to the food system transformation and do a deep dive into the problems on those. Land, for example. As we speak, a woman or 
and many places of the world cannot inherit their land because they're not entitled to. Land management and land governance needs to have a deep dive from the legal perspective that includes, as our uh, last participant from Nigeria said, the political dimensions, the decision-making uh, uh, dimensions, the legislative answers to this. Land, water, climate, and natural resources. Water access needs a response from governance and, of course, from rule of law. The climate impact of systems that can respond to disaster, for example, is something that needs to be designed and respond from the government's perspective. As for, as for the rule of law in specific, the integration of the SDG 16 is a key element to contribute to the accountable institutions that respond to individuals for the right to food. Thank you. She, I know we are going to be getting a, a really rich uh, output out of uh, legal minds, you know? And sometimes we don't engage our legal uh, people enough to help us navigate through a lot of, these are myriad of issues that are really complex, but not impossible. So uh, I'm going to give Florence 30 seconds. Then I'll move back to our panelists, and then we wrap up in earnest. Florence, you have 30 seconds. Nico? Nico? Okay, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mrs. Chair. Very interesting uh, contributions. I just want to recall in September 2021, the CEO of BioVision Foundation presented in the uh, UN Food Systems Summit in New York the policy brief that had been prepared on governance on food systems transformation within a governance action area. And I just sent that link to you, Mrs. Chair. You, I think it would be a useful document that we can update, enrich, and whatever, and that could be the basis of a consensus. Um, the second point, uh, uh, Director Indarto mentioned the importance of local approaches. Definitely, UN Habitat is very interested in territorial development because that's where we go close to nature, to culture, and uh, revive the local economy. And we believe this is going to be essential as we move towards 2030 within the local 2030 coalition. And my last point, and I think I'm in the 30 seconds, is there is a side event at 6 o'clock this afternoon. Regrettably, it's virtual, but it's on territorial governance for sustainable and inclusive food system transformation. And I hope some of you will be able to register and join the side event. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Florence. Uh, now, if I may turn to our panelists, I need you to, after having listened to the rich discussions you know, from yourselves and also from the questions from the floor and from our respondents. I need you to literally give me one parting shot. I don't need another speech. One message in 15 seconds. What came to you, what was very profound that you can now share with us? I'll start with, anyone can go, but let me start from from the far end, you're on the spot. One in 15 seconds. Thank you very much. The role of political commitment in uh, supporting, in funding, and approving changes in the legal regulatory frameworks. Linking with existing frameworks, constant engagement, joint, joint, joint action, and uh, implementation monitoring and uh, Reporting. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Jaro, in 15 seconds. Yeah, uh, one is evidence based. It is important for all stakeholders to, uh, to engage, uh, putting our effort to transform our food system into local context, and also uh, collaboration among all stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you. Alvin? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think leadership is really important in, in this uh, food systems transformation and the awareness that probably when, while we uh, transform our food systems, 
This will have consequences of, on governance as well. So we might need to think about how do we govern food. And uh, there I, I fully subscribe with what a, our a, 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 a rapporteur said that a, the rule of law is really very important in that, a effective a participation decision making. So I think it's, it's kind of a two track approach you have to take. We have to transform the substance and we have to transform governance on that. Great. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are coming to the close of our very animated session. So, let me just try to um, think through what I heard, you know, from our respondents, you know, in totality with the rest of the speakers. Consultation, inclusiveness is important. And Lani said, we have so many conferences. So many conferences, but are we taking the recommendations, the conclusions from the conferences and transforming them into actionable items, actions on the ground where the rubber hits the tarmac? I think we are really missing the mark. We come to these conferences, we keep repeating what we said, but we are not really holding ourselves accountable and debriefing and reporting back on what we have do, done to move the needle forward. And what I heard also was that multi-stakeholder, managing the interests of multi-stakeholders is very critical because everybody is going to have their idea of what they want to, to get out of any system, but really uh, working through a cohesive and coherent manner would be good. And uh, limited participation by other people is our Achilles heel. So we should draw in from some of the good practices that we had, how we include those that are voiceless or marginalized. And then coming to the legal thing, protecting the right to food, of course, everybody said it here, and empower, you know, the empowerment for everybody to have the capacities and the skills to know what to do, how, when, and with how much. And of course, with as much participation and with much partnership that is transparent, that is accountable, that is delivering, where we need it to go. And then, of course, engaging with the UTS systems, looking at the customary systems and the modern systems, because we have a lot of traditional knowledge that sometimes is not infused into the modern uh, systems as we know them. So now, looking at the topic at our hands here, uh, you know, of course, on governance for agri-food systems transformation. Let's th think through those keywords. How do we move forward? How can we do better at the next, you know, UNFSS plus four? That time, I don't want us to be talking the same thing, repeating ourselves. I want us to be taking a further step forward to say, what have we really achieved? Did we reduce food insecurity? Did we transform our agri-food systems? Did we improve food security and nutrition? So ladies and gentlemen, this is where my mandate will end. I would, now, I would now just like to thank you all participants for listening very intently, those here on, in the room and those online. We really appreciate your participation and we hope that you will be giving us feedback going forward. And I'd like to thank FAO for hosting uh, this event and in particular to thank my team who worked very tirelessly, tirelessly over the last few months now the event has been achieved, and we thank you all. Have a good lunch, and have a good rest of the conference. Thank you.